The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. On this episode, I'm joined by co-host Will Miles. You can find him at readandreaction.com and on Twitter at Will Miles SCC. Will, fun back and forth episode coming up right here on Gators Breakdown with some great guests and making our cases for Florida or Georgia to win the SEC East. Yeah, man, it's almost July. It's time for camp. And, uh, you know, that means we're all going to start arguing for our teams a little bit harder than maybe we were in uh, in April and May and June. Though there hasn't been a whole lot going on the last three months. So we've already been making our cases all, all, all off season long, but it's exciting. Football's about to start again. The magazines are out and, uh, you know, let's, let's whet everybody's appetite a little bit. It's going to be a fun one. It is going to be a fun one uh, for sure. So starting it off right here, we'll be going back and forth and making cases for these two teams with Braden Gall from Athlon Sports and a couple of friends of mine that can give us the Georgia side of things. Robbie Stelton Pohl and Spencer Van Horn from a rich tradition college football podcast. Gentlemen, welcome to Gators Breakdown. And, and Braden, I'll start with you. Listeners, uh, you can find him at Braden Gall on Twitter. But right here, a quick introduction from you for, for our listeners and uh, what you guys uh, at Athlon provide you know, for the world of college football out there. Yeah, no, number one, uh, buy magazines. Uh, <laughs> go to the, the website, athlonsports.com. Click that little button on top. It's super easy. No matter what kind of fan you are, no matter what market you're in, you can order the cover you want. And obviously, uh, that's the way to go on the digital store there. Obviously, they're on newsstands now as well all across the country. Give you a little good reading content during the summer months here before hopefully – the college football season. So, so check that out. It's the oldest running magazine in, in all of college football. And I've been there for man, almost 12, 13 years. And uh, we're pretty proud of the product. It's evolved over the, the, the course of the, the, the time I've been there. And um, even without spring practice and a global pandemic, we still think we give the readers a, a, a really good, you know, look at what's coming up this season in, in college football, the best we can. And I hope people enjoy it. So give us a few bucks and we'll give you some good content, man. Quickly, Braden, uh, how much did not having spring practice change everything for you guys? Uh, certainly a little bit, and that's the, been the number one question all, all season or all preseason, all magazine season, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that, that's been clearly the issue. I, I would say my, I've sort of developed some muscle memory on this answer. There's two parts of it. Number one is it's it's definitely more difficult because our business model is not like other magazines. We go to the market. We hire writers from every single – campus and power five football we hire guys that cover the teams men and women that are on the beat go to press conference talk to coaches talk to players they know what's going on and so we're really proud of the content we deliver for each team um, and and how you know the level of quality that that is but at the same time it, you know we not having those people in those locations is going to hurt making decisions just like it's going to hurt a defensive coach trying to develop his defensive line or an offensive coach trying to work on his route tree or whatever it's 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 difficult but uh, at the same time, second part to that answer is these little feudal dictators that run these college football programs, they don't really let you see a whole lot of anything anyway. So you're you're still guessing it at who's going to play quarterback at Tennessee this year. You're still guessing at who's going to play quarterback at Alabama this year. E- even if you were at practice and writing that story, you'd still be saying, well, you know, I, I, I think it's Mac Jones, but maybe it's Bryce Young. And so, uh, you know, it, it's not as bad as it th- as you think. But it certainly is, is a negative as far as information. So we, we did the best job we could with the most information we had. And um, that's I, I think that's the, the most anybody could ask for. And hopefully we delivered some good content for people. You did. You did. Big fan. Big fan of the magazine. So moving on, Robbie and Spencer are hosts of a Rich Tradition College Football Podcast. Uh, guys, give us a quick background on the pod and yourselves as you'll be providing mostly the Bulldog side of here, uh, side of things here on uh, Gators Breakdown. So, uh Spencer and I have actually been really close friends for almost 10 years now. Um, And uh, at Valdosta State University, where we went to school together, um, we, we, we did this, we did this dumb, like uh, college, college radio show uh, because Spencer, Spencer was taking the classes. So we had access to that. So we started doing that together. And then um, I, you know, as Spencer likes to say, I hate, I showed that I hated him and moved away because I got married and got a job. Um, and, uh, and Spencer stayed, uh, Spencer is still in town in Badassa, uh, doing his, his radio show, which I'll let him talk about in a second, but our, our dream together has always been to do a podcast together about college football. Um, it's not Georgia focused. Uh, we are Georgia fans. 
Uh, but it's the spe whole spectrum of college football that we enjoy. Like I'm, I'm the weirdo that watches Marshall play the Citadel on a Tuesday night. So, um, and so we, we've just kind of been doing this together for the last year, year and a half. And, um, and then obviously you and I know each other, Dave, uh, through our friend Bunkley. And, um, we are supposed to be evil rivals. Like we're supposed to hate each other, but, uh, but we don't. So Spencer, what's up? You want to add to that? Well, yeah, no, we just, uh, yeah, about a year and a half that we've been working on, uh, the, the podcast together. Uh, I've been in radio now for, uh, I guess we're coming up on seven years. I've been able to do play by play for Valdosta state football for uh, the last seven years as well. So we're, um, we're having a lot of fun kind of venturing into something new with just the two of us, but uh, it's been a good time here the the last year and a half. All right. So uh, let's get into this. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun here uh, will be had. It will be had. Absolutely. But before we get there, Remember, you can find Gators Breakdown on news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. Find all the past Gators Breakdown episodes there as well as, as News for Jacks coverage of the Gator. Please share, rate, and review the show. Subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. And follow Gators Breakdown on social media, on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. So, Braden, I mean, of course... We, we, we go back to the end of last season and all the way too early rankings and all that stuff come out and everybody, you know, seems to do those. And some we started seeing Florida ranked ahead of Georgia in some of those. It was kind of split 50 50, I think, uh, among a way too early things. But of course, everything gets kind of ramped up the closer to the season we get. These magazines uh, start coming out. And you know, even though Georgia has been the team controlling the SEC East in recent years, you probably knew this was going to turn some heads uh, when you guys were discussing your Athlon rankings and, you know, probably one of the bigger debates out there uh, is the SEC East right now. So how close was it between you guys at Athlon between Florida and Georgia? Uh, not, not even close. Uh, I would say the number one most difficult decision we had as it pertained to a division champion in any conference on a power five level Um you know, th these are two teams that could win the SEC. These are two teams that could probably compete for national championships and ironically, especially Georgia. Uh, but I, I think when you ask me what was the toughest decision we had to make, I think Texas, Oklahoma State and Iowa State for second place in the Big 12, in the Big 12 behind Oklahoma. Uh, you know, Ohio State and Penn State are pretty, pretty darn close in the in the Big 10 East. Uh, you know, there's a, there's some debate maybe in the Pac-12 South, but I, I really don't think it's close. I think Georgia, Florida is the most difficult decision we had to make as a staff. And and even on, on you know, tonight with you guys, uh, you know, Athlon Sports picked Florida six, Georgia seven overall nationally. That, you know, out of 130, that basically means they're dead even. I, I might change my mind by the end of this show. I might pick Georgia by the end of this show. So yeah, you will. I, yeah, you I, will. I, just, <laughs> I just think it's it's incredibly difficult to discern between the two. There's a really clear case for Georgia. There's a really clear case for Florida, and it makes that that meeting in Jacksonville all the more important and and all the more exciting to, you know, can't wait to figure out. We're going to hear a whole lot of crap if if Georgia wins. We're going to catch a lot of flack, and we're we're okay with that. I mean, we 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 argued about it, we discussed it, and we had a really difficult time deciding. And I think right now, or at least in in April when we made the decision, you know, late March, early April when we went to press, I, I think the 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 bullet points kind of lined up a little bit more with Florida. And uh, doesn't mean Georgia's not basically dead even. I mean, they're they're dead even right now. So it, it was as impossible a decision as we had the entire the entire magazine, and that's why they're six and seven nationally out of 130, which like I said, makes them basically dead even. I guess we're, I'll, I'll go from it next. We'll bring you in here. And of course we, we kind of look forward ahead when Dan Mullen was hired, we kind of pinpointed year three would be the year to make the move. Uh, and we had no idea if Jake Fromm was still going to be quarterback. When it's, Hey, and when Dan Mullen was hired, we had no idea Jake Fromm was still going to tor torch Florida for <laughs> two, two years in a row uh, there. So, but you know, he's, he's now gone. Georgia's got some offensive changes. We, we see what's going on at Georgia. We see what's going on at Alabama. We see what's going on at LSU. Is it more of a case? And I'll ask the other guys too. We can, we can all debate this. Is it more of a case of the teams coming back to Florida or Florida actually raising up a bit? Uh, I mean, I think it's probably the teams coming back to Florida more than anything. I think when you look at, um, 
when you look at Georgia as a program, I think there's no doubt that they've been ahead of Florida for the last three or four years and, you know, maybe even a little bit longer. And it's not really a surprise based on the amount of the, the players that Kirby Smart's brought in. And then certainly he had a really good quarterback in Jake Fromm for two or three years and was able to, was able to take advantage of that. Um, you know, obviously Georgia's fallen a little bit short of their ultimate goal, which gives us a little bit of fodder on the Florida side, but it's no fun to get beat like a drum by Georgia and then, and then, and then watch them lose to Alabama or, or somebody else later in the season. So, yeah, I, I think this is sort of a perfect storm when you start looking at it. I mean, COVID is obviously a terrible thing, but it does raise some interesting some interesting issues for both teams. I mean, you've got the the transition from Coley to Monk in there at Georgia where, you know, are they going to have time to install their system? You've got Kirby Smart and some noise that might occur if if another – if another game like South Carolina last year pops up, you got Jamie Newman who played pretty well at Wake Forest, but not necessarily against elite competition. Um, so all those things sort of heap together along with the emergence of Kyle Trask last year as a real weapon through the air, I think gives Florida fans and, and gives people who are trying to look at this from the outside objectively, um, you know, reason to believe that Florida is going to be able to compete, but you know, end of, end of the day, I think really the thing that seals it for most people when they're looking at the comparison between these two, it's just the schedule, right? I mean, Florida has to beat Georgia has to beat LSU and that's really about it. Whereas Georgia's going at Alabama plays Auburn, Florida and the Tennessee late in the year. And based on what's happened at Tennessee the last few years, um, if the Vols do start to sh show a resurgence this year, I think you'd expect them to be better when they're facing Georgia than they are when they're facing Florida. And I think part of this too is, uh, you know, I, I say has, you know, has Florida caught up with the rest of the teams? Has the rest of the teams fallen back? There's a popular debate out there, and, and, and Robbie, I'll start you with this one. Has Florida closed the gap? And there's, I think there's different ways to look at that. You can look at it on the recruiting front. You can look at it what's happened the last couple of years on the field when maybe the, the score has not necessarily shown how much control Georgia was in the game it's, it, itself. When, when, when you see, Oh, Florida's closed the gap. They're coming. What's the what's the first thought that comes to your mind? I I actually I, I thought about this today while, while I was just walking around here in Podunk, Oneida, Kentucky, where I'm here with my brother. I, I was thinking about the, the that that question because you texted me like that would be one of the questions that we would ask, and I I kind of my my response is another question like what does that mean? Yep. Because if you're talking about closing the gap talent wise. If we go, let's just our, let's just for argument's sake, we look at the blue chip ratio from twenty four seven. Like there is a ten percent increase for for Florida from last year to this year, but there is a there is an eight percent increase for Georgia from last year to this year. So like I, I don't know. So if you're looking at that based off blue chip ratio, like it, I would probably say no. But I, I think when we when we talk about closing the gap, can we we talk about closing the gap expectation wise? I think I think so. I think we, yeah. I think they have closed the gap. Um, now, my argument would be: Does that have as much merit as people want to say? But like talent wise, I mean, it's really hard. It, it's really hard to say, talk about the. It's really hard to talk about the talent description di discre uh, discrepancy without talking about just how great of a recruiter Kirby is compared to you know, what Dan Mullen has done. So I would say expectation wise, yes, the the gap has closed. I hope that answers your question without me babbling. Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Spencer, what do you think about that one? No, yeah, throughout the rest of the SEC, yeah, I think the 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 gap has been closed uh, a good bit when you talk about playing against Tennessee and South Carolina and those other places and closing the gap uh, that brings them closer to Georgia. So yeah, I agree that the uh, that the gap has been closed from an expectation standpoint. I certainly understand what Robbie, and I think everybody understand what Robbie's talking about when he mentions the uh, recruiting. But, uh, yeah, I think Florida has closed that gap a little bit, and they're ready to take that next step, which is, uh, which is finishing sort of what they've started in these last two games against Georgia, which is hanging really close and just missing out on being able to, uh, to finish the job. Yeah, Brady, and that's the thing. I think there are different ways, like Robbie said, there's different ways to view how has Florida closed the gap. Certainly on the recruiting front, you you won't say it. And, and Florida's had some good, 
you know, transfer portal, you know, if you, you the way 24 seven and rivals look at the transfer portal is a whole lot different. They don't really count it uh, as much as believe me, Florida fans like to count it. <laughs> They'll be the first to point out, Oh, look at the, tra- look at the transfers he's brought in. And th- that makes a difference. And it has made a difference. You know, Jonathan Gennard, Van Jefferson are moving on to the NFL, big, big contributors for Florida uh, that has made up for somewhat uh, of recruiting issues of guys not getting on campus uh, such last couple classes, uh, certainly better than, what it was when Jim McElwain was leading it, but you know, a clear step behind what George is doing on the recruiting front. And then the last two years, the, the game itself and the final rankings showed the teams were pretty close. You know, 2018 and uh, 2019 games, you know, had Georgia struggling coming into the game in Jacksonville, which led you know, many to pick Florida uh, going into the game. Robbie, I was on your podcast last year. You actually picked Florida going into the game last year. I did. Uh, yeah. So 2018, we probably got ahead, our, ahead of ourselves a, a bit much there. Uh, you know, Florida hung, hung tough for a little while, had taken their early third quarter lead, a goal line stand for the ages, but but couldn't hunt, couldn't hang with Georgia. Georgia's eventually too much. Last year, you could definitely you know see why Florida was getting picked as Georgia was coming off that South Carolina loss, a, a subpar performance uh, against Kentucky. In, in that downpour, Florida had played LSU very tough in Baton Rouge a couple games before that, and, and that was their only loss heading into that game last year. But, you know, you go back to last year, and a lot of people like to – Co- you know, point out that the coach Dan Mullen is compared to Kirby Smart. Where Mullen got outcoached and outmanned last year, and I don't think you know I, I'm not stepping out on the ledge to say that it, it, that's exactly what happened uh, last year. You know, Florida played scrappy, kept the game closer than it probably should have been, uh, but came up short once again. So, do, do we make too much out of the final scores in those games when we say close the gap uh, in, in looking at these two teams? I, I would I would say 100. percent I mean, I you know. If you're a Florida fan, you're gonna pop in the tape of the of the goal line stand on first and goal on the inch line and go, look, we can do it. You know what I mean? Like if I'm a coach for Florida, I'm gonna say, look, you guys went toe to toe with a team that is clearly better than you, and you just lined up and stuffed them on on four straight plays. And so I think you can. I think the games you could argue if you're a Florida coach, you're probably pitching, hey, they were closer than 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 the scores finally indicated. If you're a Georgia fan, you're going three straight divisions. What are y'all talking about? So I, I think you can argue it both sides. I think the recruiting is is clearly in Georgia's favor. I, I don't think that, that that is the only area. So I guess the way I would look at it is there, there are two sort of – they're two of the best coaches in college football. And there are two weaknesses that are pretty easily identifiable for both of them. One of them for Georgia and Kirby Smart is are you going to evolve? Are you going to do what Nick Saban did with Lane Kiffin? What Coach O, who was a defensive line coach that LSU fans didn't even want – who, by the way, lost 37-7 to to Dan Mullen when Dan Mullen was at Mississippi State, lost in the swamp in his first year at LSU. Dan Mullen, by the way, 2-1 and one against Coach O and had the lead last year in Baton Rouge against the best team of all time in the third quarter. The, 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 Kirby Snart needs to evolve on offense. And is Todd Monk in the answer? Is Jamie Newman the answer? A rebuilt offensive line? Somebody other than George Pickens needs to step up. I'm not worried about the talent, though, because the question for Florida – is Dan Mullen, can you recruit at the same level as the Dabo Sweeney's, the Kirby Smarts, Jimbo Fisher even at Texas A&M, and Nick Saban and, and Ryan Day at Ohio State? I, I still think there's a – you're, you're shooting for razor-thin margins of error here. You're, you're talking about winning national championships and SEC titles. You know, Georgia, and I always say this, Georgia, when they fired Mark Rick, they were shooting at an extremely small target. They, they were trying to be better than 10-2 and two and better than ninth in the nation in recruiting. Right, that's what Mark Rick did for for 15 years, and it turns out Kirby Smart was able to do that, which is an extremely small target, and he elevated just that one notch. And they played in the national title game, and they played in the SEC championship three straight years. Mullen has to prove, a, a, to me at least, a guy who really loves him as a coach, that there's a next tier to his recruiting. Just like Kirby needs to prove that there's a next tier to his offensive evolution, and and that that those are two things that. What's ironic is that the other guy is great at it, right? Like Dan Mullen, no questions about his offensive scheme, no questions about his ability to innovate, no questions about his ability to develop a quarterback. His track record goes back 20 years creating great quarterbacks and offenses. Kirby Smart is clearly a Nick Saban trained assassin to go out on the recruiting trail and literally steal his players. So, uh, and his and his strength and conditioning coach for that matter. So, uh, I, I think there's there's sort of weird. You know, kind of there's this parallel thing that's going on with the two of them that I find as a as an outside observer, just fascinating and, and, and fun to watch because, you know, Florida could be favored in every single game they play this year, including the game in Jacksonville, depending on what Georgia does. 
But if Georgia comes out of the gate with Newman and Munkin and they're great and they're evolved and they, they play Alabama really hard or beat them in, in early in the season, Georgia can win the national championship. So it, it's, a, it's a really fun back and forth between the two. And, again, you can talk yourself into both of them. So Before we get to uh, kind of player-specific issues or, or position group issues here, Robbie, Spencer, did you guys have issues or do you have issues with seeing Florida ranked ahead of Georgia so much in a lot of these – almost Athlon, the, the other preseason magazines out there, the ones I've seen have Florida ahead of Georgia. I For Athlon specific, I'll just talk on Athlon because I haven't read the other – uh, the, the other magazines yet. Uh, I actually have no problem. And, and it helps that I, I listen to y'all, you know, to Braden's podcast and their explanation of, of their, of what they're doing. They're not just saying preseason ranking. They're looking at the end of the season, who will be ranked higher. And I understand that correct, Braden, right? Like that's. Yeah, no. And it's, we, it's, it's kind of a weird small caveat, right? Like our, our numbers are projecting that what the end of the season ranking will look like. Yeah. And, and so with that, I, I, I don't really like not to, you know, I, I, I was come out, coming on here to debate, but I don't have a huge debate with this because like, like you've mentioned already, the schedule for Georgia is harder and it might be one game harder, but it's still one really important game in Tuscaloosa. That's harder. I, I don't have a problem with it. My, my beef, I guess, or what I'm going to, what I'm going to focus on is, Florida lost to the worst Georgia offense since 2015 last year. That is the that, that is statistically the worst offense that Georgia's had since Kirby's been there. 2015, when we had freaking Brian Schottenheimer, who's apparently really good in the NFL and sucks in college. He, you know, are the worst offense we've had in almost four or five years, and they still lost to that. And the entire elite top tier defense of Georgia returns, and so like that's. The, the game in Jacksonville is where I have a difference, like a, a problem with, like, because I think Georgia can and will beat Florida in Jacksonville. But preseason or this ranking, the way Athlon did it, I don't have a problem with it because, again, the schedule is so much easier. And y'all get to play LSU at home with, you know, like Braden said, arguably the greatest team of all time where they lost, what, 14 draft picks? So I, I just don't have a, I don't have a huge problem with the ranking issue. No, yeah, I, I agree as well that uh, in terms of projections going forward, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of reason to to like Florida. I like how uh, Florida also ended the last two seasons as well. Uh, just the momentum behind that program seems to be really strong, so it doesn't give me an issue that uh, that anybody would take Florida uh, over Georgia at this point. It was almost expected, uh, at least in this neck of the woods where I where I have conversations at. So. Uh, it was expected on that front. And then, two, when you look at whether or not Florida has upgraded offensive line, there's been some uh, there's been some additions at that spot for them over the offseason. So there's the idea that bringing them along the development at other places, the offensive line will catch up to that as well. And they will perhaps, uh, you know, start running the ball a little bit better. I think the ratio last year was very far off from 50 to 50. So they'll probably try to get back to that a little bit this year. And, um, and I, and so I think if, if Florida is able to do that and kind of help Kyle Trask out a little bit, then yeah, there's no reason to believe that this Florida team won't be victorious in Jacksonville and representing the East in Atlanta. Will, I just going here. So you know, not not many people, you know, with the issue of Florida or ahead of Georgia, but you know, Robbie emphatically states, you know, Georgia's going to win in Jacksonville. So we, that, that, that's where we have to, that's where we have to debate a bit. And, and why can Florida beat Georgia? I mean, look, part of there is kind of a two part debate here. Can Florida win the SEC East? And as we said, with the schedule and, and you look at the whole 12 game schedule, you know, Florida does have an advantage there. Most people still think it's going to come down to the game in Jacksonville. So if you, Florida's going to have to get the victory in Jacksonville in, in many people's mind to, to, to get to Atlanta. So, while both questions are kind of separate, they're also related because many people don't think Florida's going to get to Atlanta without that victory, and you know we're, we're kind of one of them. But not only that, eventually, you know, talent's not going to be an excuse for for, for Dan Mullen uh, and all that. Eventually, he's going to have to get a win in Jacksonville, and this is the year everybody's pointing to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a few things when you look at what 
that that Georgia game last year, I, I agree a lot with what was said, except for the fact that Florida also had the worst offensive line that Dan Mullen's ever going to have last year. And you can see it when you go back and look at the film that Georgia was really able to squeeze Trask in ways that if Florida is able to run the ball, I'm not sure they're going to be able to. It's also It was also Trask's first time playing a defense anywhere near that good because we can talk about LSU being the best team, you know, maybe even ever, but their defense was not. That was an offensively led team. And so, you know, the first time Trask really had to face a top, top tier defense was that game. I think he learned a lot and hopefully he'll be able to carry that forward. I, I think it's interesting what Braden was talking about in terms of recruiting. I mean, it's it, it's obviously no competition. We've we've gone over that endlessly on this podcast, you and I, Dave. But one of the things I think is pretty interesting is when you look at what they've done with that talent, so versus top 25 talent from 2016 to 2019, Kirby Smart 17 and 12. And from 2016 to 2019 against the same top 25 talent, but two of those years at Mississippi State, Dan Mullen 17 and 12. So, you know, from the standpoint of what they're doing with the guys when they have them on the field, and the thing that maybe if I were if I were a Georgia fan would concern me is last year, you know, you, you mentioned the anemic offense at Georgia, and a lot of that with Jake Fromm and the struggles that he was having. Well, Georgia actually threw the ball more last year than they did in either 2018 or 2017, and it wasn't even particularly close. I mean, Georgia yeah. ran the ball almost 70% of the time in 2017 and ran it 55% of the time last year. So it, it, it strikes me that the coach isn't necessarily making the adjustments on the field for what he's seeing because we saw that Fromm was struggling, but they weren't making those sorts of adjustments. Whereas when you look at Florida, and one of the things I think was really impressive about what Mullen did last year is they ran the ball 61% of the time with Felipe Franks in 2018. And last year they couldn't run the ball at all, and they only ran it 44% of the time. He made a definitive change when Trask came in in that ten, basically from that Kentucky game on and was chucking the ball all over the place. And, and I think that indicates something where that's where I get hope, but obviously I, I'm somebody who looks at the, at the recruiting numbers and I understand what that means. And I understand you're going in already, you know, two, three, four points down, you're going to have to play your best game to beat Georgia. And that defense is, uh, is, is something to be, something to be admired and, and they're going to be really, really good. It's going to be a great game in Jacksonville. The only thing I hope is that all the wristbands are, are situated this year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a question just for everybody in the room, you know, uh, including Braden. Like if Kirby hadn't made the change and he kept Coley for another year, is it even a discussion of who the better team is or who who's going to win in Jacksonville? I mean, I I would say absolutely, just because again, Georgia could have thirty first team All SEC front seven players, and and I don't know about you, but only seven of them can start. <laughs> um, but they're they're just, I mean, they're gonna. It's like a hockey line change. They're just gonna rotate dudes that are just ridiculously good. And um, you know, it's interesting. The front you you mentioned the from passing statistics, which I find fascinating because I, again, you guys can fact check me on this. I don't have it in front of me. This is off the top of my head. I want to say from was something like over five in his career in three years when they threw the ball more than 30 times. And he was like, you know, 35 and two or something like that when, when he threw the ball 29 times or less. And, and so it, it does speak to sort of the, listen, we win when Jake Fromm doesn't throw it a lot and we run the football. So I get why Kirby smart, like kind of gets into that cycle, but that's not the way the game is being played. Like the game is being played now at these upper echelon levels. And Jamie Newman is sort of a specifically a player that allows him to do more in the offense, which is why, of course, we can go round and round on this. We can go back to Florida, and I can say part of the reason I like the Dan Mullen, Philippe, uh, Philippe Franks, Dan Mullen, Kyle Trask, Emory Jones combination, I trust those three better than the Georgia combination of Monk and Newman and question mark behind him. I trust the Florida quarterback room more than I trust the Georgia quarterback room. There's more continuity there. And I think the coach is arguably the best offensive coach in America. So that that's sort of where, you know, Kirby might be the best defensive coach in America with the best front seven in America and the best defense in America. And that's, what's going to make the game so great. I, I don't think you can definitively say one thing or the other, you know, whether it's Coley still in charge, whether it's Emory Jones has taken over as a starter, whether it's still Trask, whether it's Newman, whether it's Fromm, I, I just I think it's a it it's a dead even battle between two really good offense um, an offensive mind and a defensive mind and, and if, if you think about it you know Florida loses that game Georgia's going to have to lose to Bama and somebody else and then Florida has to run the table including LSU including a road game against Tennessee including a road game against Ole Miss by the way that's going to be a really tricky game so that they're you know Kentucky is no joke this year 
that is a football team capable of beating both of them. So when it, Kentucky's it, given Florida, Florida problems more than anybody else has in the last three, four years. <laughs> and they're almost as good this year as they were two years ago. Uh, Going to be this good. They have one of the best offensive lines in America. I, I just, uh, you know, if Terry Wilson's back healthy and he's sort of developed, I think, from two years ago, even though he's taken a lot of time off with the injury. I, I just think the schedules are a little bit more, you know, you know, Kirby Smart lost to South Carolina last year because some maybe some bad penalties and, you know, whatever, a missed field goal. But I, I think that there's – I just think it's basically dead even. I, I, don't, I don't have – if you think one way or the other is something's going to happen in that game, I think you're just lying and sort of guessing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what makes this sport so great is, you know, we can look at one team with maybe a little bit more talent. We can look at another team with a little bit more continuity. Offensive coach, defensive coach, great rivalry, neutral – literally a neutral field. Like it's, it's everything you could ask for as a college football fan. The – I'm sorry. I just the, – the reason why I asked that question is because like all – People like you, Braden, or, or other analysts, you know, all last season, the, the the critique was the anemic offense of of Georgia, you know, and why can't they why can't they do more? Why they have all this talent? Why can't they do more? And I, like, it, it may not work. Like, I I fully accept that possibility that Munkin and Newman and J T Daniels may not work, but at least he's changing because. I, you know, all you hear from Georgia fans and message boards and, and people who are in Athens that I talk to is that Kirby is really headstrong. He's very stubborn. He doesn't want to change things that he thinks works. But the fact that he was willing to go and change to a possible more dynamic offense with his precious defense maybe having to be on the field a little bit more, I I, I find that to be encouraging as a Georgia fan. So that's, that's, that's just the reason why I asked that question. Yeah, and I think it depends on if it actually happens because we, we, you know, we, the collective media, basically wrote that exact same column about LSU and Les Miles for a decade. Like, when are you going to change, dude? Like, when are you going to stop with the little pitch, toss, sweep, off tackle? <laughs> like, when are you going to change, dude? And every year we heard the same thing. This year's the year we're going to change. LSU is going to be different. We're going to be dynamic. We're going to be in the spread. Every year they said the same thing. And every year we wrote the same column and did the same podcast. And every we year heard, we heard it for a year that Florida wouldn't will much yet. Yeah, every year it didn't change. <laughs> it, did, it didn't change. And so I, I think what was weird, what's ironic about the whole thing, not only do you go 15-0, and 0, you win the whole thing, and you put up the best numbers you know, offensively in college football history, but you did it with a guy that no one had literally heard his voice before. Like no one had heard – Joe Brady had never done an interview with anybody. And so it's almost ironic that through all these years of asking the same questions about LSU under Les Miles and Coach O – that it took some random passing game coordinator from the Saints that no one's ever heard of before who actually did it. And Joe Burrow had to develop. Oh, by the way, you had a bunch of talented receivers. Your offensive line came together. Clyde Edwards Hilaire is great. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, with Georgia, it's 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 the same kind of thing. We can we can say all we want to. He can say all the things that he wants to in press conferences and he can say all the right stuff. But what matters is what does the offense look like on the field? And we're just not gonna know that until until the games start and, and probably, you know, what is it? Week three against Alabama when we find out, Hey, are you going to actually, are you actually evolving or, or are you still, you still kind of, cause again, the, the stat on Jake Fromm is the reason you don't have to evolve, right? When you don't throw the ball a whole lot, you win every time. And, and that's what Georgia did so many, so many times under Jake Fromm, you didn't have to. And even again, even, even against Alabama, you know, you're in the national championship game and Tua takes the worst sack in the history of his entire career. And you could have had the game. So like one bad defensive coverage away doesn't change the fact that Kirby smart maybe did something a little off on offense. Like it's just such a, a fine line. The game is such a fine line and, and you can, it's a, there's a million ways to second guess things after the fact and hindsight's 2020 and all that good stuff. And, well, I think, what, and I think, oh, hold on, and that's what I think makes 2020 so interesting. And Robbie, to your question about Coley and, and Munkin, with missing spring, it may be better to have Coley and the familiarity on offense that those players would have had. Now they don't have that familiar familiarity. You're replacing quarterbacks. You're replacing offensive linemen. Granted, a lot of those offensive linemen that you know filled in last year have a have a lot of playing time. So that gets overblown a bit when people say Georgia's offensive line replaces. Well, a lot of those guys played <laughs> a good bit too. A lot of those backup offensive linemen. So, uh, but, you know, I think that's two part, you know, missing spring, but you're also missing the part where there's not a lot of continuity left over from, from the last offense. So you're changing players, you're changing, you're changing scheme. And 
no, you're not getting the benefit uh, of, of a spring for, for, for to make that transition a, a bit easier. So, you know, will, will they have enough time in the summer to, to feel comfortable? And that's why I think that Alabama game being so early in the season really hurts Georgia because – the, the time you missed in the spring now has to get rushed in the in this in this coming up summer if we get the season and the plan the way you know they're planning out the the fall camp. So I think it, it's two part because it would be nice to have the familiar familiarity of Coley, but granted, the the the, the Munkin move may not pay off in 2020. It may pay off in 2021, 2022. I think one of the things that's interesting, Dave, you made that must champ comparison. And the thing that was always frustrating to Florida fans is that they would change offensive coordinators and then must champ would still handcuff his offensive coordinator. And you could tell that the guy wasn't allowed to have the full reign within his offense. And when I think back to Alabama and when they finally started making changes, it was after Nick Saban had to adjust his defense because they'd gotten torched by Johnny Manziel. And he started getting smaller linebackers who were able to really sort of cover the boundary as opposed to some of the bigger guys that he had before. And then the change on offense came so you know one of the things that you know obviously i enjoyed the sec championship game last year with lsu beating georgia but Thanks. one of the things Thanks. But appreciate one, it i thought we were friends here thank no, you no no but, <laughs> but, but no, one of the, really had a chance let's let's be honest no no i i i i i think i said on our podcast georgia is about to get destroyed in that game yeah, but one of the things I think is that as a defensive coordinator, you got to imagine that Kirby Smart saw what that offense was able to do to his elite guys on defense and said, hmm, like that might be something we're able to do. It's, it's worth making a change. And, and like I said, I, I think that's what it took for Saban to make that change and really start making the adjustments on offense was having to make the adjustments on defense to catch up with those sort of offenses. And LSU is really the first time that even the Alabama games, you could make, you could make an argument that Georgia was right there. Right, that that they didn't have that they just needed to make the key play that they didn't need to revamp things. I think after you get beat by thirty to a team like LSU, you gotta you gotta turn around and say, okay, well, what you know, what real changes do we need to make? And and so you know whether Smart's going to take the handcuffs off or not, I think is the big question. But I think making the change to somebody who's going to bring a more modern offense is something Georgia was going to have to do, and quite honestly, was probably being demanded by the fans. Well, you know, you referenced that loss to LSU, and I think, too, what goes in hand with that about making this change and maybe even not making some of those in-game adjustments that you referenced as well earlier is that, you know, Jake Fromm goes after the Florida game almost five or six straight games where he completes, I think, an average of 47 percent of his passes. So I think there's something about that along with the LSU game, along with just the stagnant a part of the offense from last year that goes into making this change and maybe helps to influence Kirby that maybe he needs to back off and maybe he needs to let the reins go and, and give that all to Todd Monk and somebody he's going to trust that maybe at some point he just started losing faith in, uh, in James Coley. Brady, I want to bring in, uh, and I've said it plenty of times here uh, on Gators Breakdown. We always probably heard me say it 50 million times, but my favorite part of the magazine is the anonymous coaches <laughs> part. So first of all, a quick uh, part on how you guys get that together and, and how open are these coaches and you know how, what, what is the familiarity with these uh, opposing coaches views? Are they really close to their opponents and, and they can give the best analysis uh, in, in, in that anonymous coaches part? Oh, many great men and women have tried to to get that out of us at Athlon Sports. I, I do want uh, I will add one comment to the yeah. uh, the Coley Munkin, and I think this applies to every team during a pandemic. I think it applies to Mullen and Trask. I think it applies to Tennessee and both Garantano and either Harrison Bailey. I think it applies to Ryan Holinsky at South Carolina, Terry Wilson at Kentucky. I, I, I've talked to a lot of coordinators, and almost all of them have said that we are we are sort of uh, we, we've done so many mental reps and so many mental exercises that we're actually ahead of the game mentally. So if you're looking for a silver lining in the pandemic, is that almost every coach I've talked to has said that we, we've done so much preparation mentally. So if it's the system that you're worried about, if you're a Georgia fan, whether it, it with Todd Buckin and Jamie Newman sort of mentally being on the same page. I think you could argue that the pandemic has actually given them more opportunity to get on the same page. Now, physically developing an offensive line, let's say, for both of them is a lot different. That's a much dif more difficult story. But I actually think from the quarterback position alone, th they've run through so many mental reps and, and progressions and where's your eyes go supposed to be, where your footwork supposed to be. I think they've done so much of that that I think quarterback play and, and understanding schemes might actually be ahead of the game. So I wanted to 
to throw that out there first, just just to, as a as a side note. Um, the anonymous scouting reports, um, by far my favorite part of the magazine. The entire time I've worked there, I've worked at Athlon Sports for over a decade, and they are very close. Um, I cannot divulge more information no, good. Yeah. other than they are coaches, and this goes for every league, SEC, ACC, Big Ten, whatever. Uh, every single coach is within the division. And and so we want to make sure we are getting the best possible scouting report. And what's hilarious about this to me, it really is just so comical. And, and we're starting to see this a little bit with, with athletes having a little bit more power and voice on social media platforms with name, image, and likeness and the racial – uh, protests that are going on with them sort of feeling like they've got more power to speak their minds. I, I, I think that <laughs> these coaches, they are robots in front of the camera. They will never tell you anything. They will keep their mouth shut. It's, it's coach speak, coach speak, coach speak, coach speak. When you get a college football coach or a coordinator off the record or around a cocktail, they <laughs> – chat like teenage girls on a message board man i'm telling you it is so it's like it's like it's like us at sec media days it, it is it is worse <laughs> it's worse they they will just start r- rambling and r- and you're like dude the amount of content we have to cut that that lies on the cutting room floor of the magazine because we only have a you know a little paragraph to put in the the, the scouting report in the book there's a it's probably a third of what we get for each team and so we pick the best content, we plug it in there, and I think it's the best stuff because you actually get the honest truth. And it, it just imagine a world where college football coaches were just blatantly honest, especially on my favorite one is signing day. I'd love to see a coach step up to the podium on signing day and be like, man, we missed on every major defensive back <laughs> on our board. Like, we didn't get anybody we wanted. I would, I would just – like they're, they're just such – you know, they're programmed to sort of like, you know, lie almost uh, – it's like a must lie situation. You kind of have to, but then you get them off the record. Uh, we've got 30, you know, we've got since 1967, we've been, we've been doing this book and I'm not hundred percent sure when we started the, the scouting report, but um, we, we've built up a lot of trust with coaches that know that they can speak freely and that no matter how many times we are asked about it, we will not give away any of the details. We've protected their, their, their sort of the, our sources for lack of a better phrase on that for, for, decades and i think we've built up some equity with coaches in that world and um you know it it, it, but it definitely comes from people close it's that you will gain a ton of insight by reading those little blurbs and it's my favorite part of the magazine for sure all right so i'll read into the georgia one right quick before we wrap up that it it will hit on you know we'll hit on both quarterbacks for for both teams and uh one todd grantham who is very familiar with both programs of course so uh but uh the the one uh jamie newman is completely different than what they've done in the past so expect a quarterback run game and rpos not as much drop back maybe none how can they adapt that offense to fit his skill set will they bend with that with offensive coordinator Todd Munkin they will be different but how much depends on what the kid can handle so you know that's interesting uh, remarks there from, from a coach so Robbie Spencer I know every other fan base in the SEC is not buying into the Jamie Newman hype <laughs> and <laughs> that, that's to be expected uh, of course Will's you know went back and looked and, and written an article uh, on the the Jamie Newman and how he fits into Georgia and what he did at Wake Forest and you know, there there are two parts he will have a lot more talent around him there is no doubt about that he will have a better offensive line he will have better receivers he will have um, a better running backs Gan Braden I saw you doing the end maybe 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 receiver yeah, there Wake Forest is pretty underrated they got some yeah. and a wide receiver not that George yeah. Pickens not a stud but right. Um, but the, the other part of that is, too, he's going to be playing a lot better defenses, too. Uh, Florida, Auburn, Alabama there. So maybe it's a, you know, a catch even and we see some, you know, most much more of the same as what we saw at Wake Forest. And would that be enough? Would, would that be enough with that Georgia defense? It probably would be enough. And it's going to – my whole thing about Jamie Newman is there's going to come a time where he's going to have to – put a great clutch performance up. He's going to have to have great games. He's going to have to have a great game versus Alabama. He's going to have to have a great game versus Auburn. He's going to have to have a great game versus Florida. And I think that's my biggest question. I don't think my question is he won't be good. He'll be, he'll be good. I think it's, can he be good enough? Can he have the great moments? Can he have the great games that SEC quarterbacks have to have to carry a team to Atlanta? Go ahead, Spencer. I'll let you go first. Well, I was going to uh, think that, you know, Braden was talking about the idea of mental reps 
and that, you know, what can the kid handle uh, was was part of that coaching uh, anonymous coaching review. And maybe from that standpoint, the offense will be ready to go, uh, you know, on a mental front and then they can use the Virginia game, which won't be easy at all. And the East uh, East Tennessee State game as a way to sort of start feeling that out on the field. And then with Alabama and the way that they're breaking in a new quarterback and obviously some receivers as well, um, you're going to, you know, maybe that defense is, this might be one of the better opportunities to be breaking in a bunch of new things because of how good the D- Georgia defense should be this upcoming year. But yeah, it's, uh, I agree with David completely. He's going to have to be a star. He's going to have to be a star against Alabama and against Florida and against Auburn. And in the, uh, if they make it to the SEC championship game, he's going to have to be a star 100%. There's not going to be a whole lot of room for error for Jamie Newman and this offense. So uh, 100% agree, but I think it comes at an interesting time when the Georgia defense is going to be really good. And then on top of that, the uh, the mental reps that you've been able to get in the uh, in the offseason like Braden touched on. And, and, and Robbie, before you get there, that's kind of where I'm going with that. There, there's always times, no matter how good a defense is, there's always one or two games where yes. the defense can't hang. It, yep. it always happens, no matter how good a defense Oklahoma, is. Oklahoma, a Rose Bowl. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, there's, okay. always, there's always a time. That, that second half of Georgia's defense totally they were, <laughs> Baker yeah. Mitchell had nothing in the second half, man. Yes. Yep. Right. But, but there's always a time where the offense has to carry your team somewhere along the way. And you know, you go back and look at the SEC championship game last year, which we've already mentioned. You know, you would like to see a Georgia offense more explosive. So can, can Jamie Newman basically be that difference? And if you get into an LSU style shootout, that you know, Georgia can pull it out. Okay, obviously the the Georgia bias would be absolutely Kirby's going to figure it out. It's going to happen. It's it's, it's going to happen. Uh, but I actually my leaning is not even on Jamie Newman because you you mentioned it, David. Just the he doesn't have to be a Heisman candidate. He doesn't have to you know he doesn't have to win all these awards. He just has to be good enough. And for for me. For him to be good enough, I think playmakers have to get the freaking ball. Like uh, Kirby Smart specifically, last two dra- uh, last two recruiting classes has brought in the best wide receivers that they've probably had in a in a long, long time. Arian Smith, Justin Jefferson are coming in. Uh, Rosamy, the, these guys who are incredibly fast that that are track stars, finally playing wide receiver. I th- and, and also, let me just – I want this to be very clear, and I think Braden will agree with this, who's probably watched as much Georgia football as we have because he will, he loves all football. James Cook's not use in Georgia's offense mm-hmm. in the last two years, it, it, they should be arrested for how <laughs> much, for not using him the, the way they should. And, and so, like, if Jamie Newman can just do dump passes, mesh routes, and just get playmakers the ball – I think that enough with these guys who are fast, who who are great playmakers, they will make Jamie Newman look like an awesome quarterback. Does that make sense, David? Like, yeah, because because I think that's important. I think the scheme is, I think the scheme is actually more important than Jamie Newman. It like I, I under I know that may sound ridiculous, but I think Jamie Newman just has to not suck and just, and just perform, just do the just do the scheme the way it's laid out because there's playmakers all over the place. I, I think we're dancing around something with the quarterback position that I find really interesting. And, and that is to win national championships, which means you got to win three games in a row, probably maybe more against top 10 competition, right? Like amongst the best teams in America, no matter what league you're in, you're probably going to have to win a conference championship game and two playoff games to win a national title. And the way it used to be, Greg McElroy, Matt Flynn, Matt Mock, Craig Krenzel, if you want to dive <laughs> deep into the repertoire, you, you could have those guys. And you could have guys that just managed games. And and, were, and I know that's a cliche term, but guys that were smart, took care of the football, got the team into the right play and, and executed, right? I, I, am, I, I am curious to see where we go because now not only do you have to have coaching staffs that are great, three to four to five recruiting classes stacked on top of each other that are great and elite. But now guess what's happening with those teams that have all that stuff. They're also hitting on the super Uber quarterback too. It's Justin Fields who, sorry, Georgia fans have tra- has transferred. He should have never come to Georgia in the first place. It's okay. Probably not. It's, it's Trevor. Lawrence. No, no, we, believe me. We were trying to get him to Gainesville. Believe me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but like, look, but look around. I mean, look at Oklahoma, look at LSU. Like, 
it's not just about having elite talent. It's not just about having elite coaching. It's not just about getting some lucky breaks or a couple of guys develop. Like you almost have to have a guy who's a superstar now to win the national title. So I'm curious. I, I'm not saying this is one way or the other. I'm just sort of throwing the question out there. I, I'm with with you guys. I think Jimmy Newman's a really good football player. And I think most most college football fans think he's a really good college football player. The question isn't, is he a really good college football player? It goes back to what you're saying, Dave, about you know, in, in a critical moment on third and eight on the road against so-and-so, can you come up with a play that you can make that no one else can make? And if you can do that, you got a chance to win a national title. And I think you almost have to have that now. Deshaun Watson, you know, yeah, Jake Coker won a championship. I got it. He threw for a bunch of yards, and that was one of the greatest Alabama teams ever. But since that game, who has won a national championship without a, a sort of an elite quarterback making big plays? And whether it was Tua in overtime, whether it was Trevor Lawrence torching Alabama, you know, whether it's Joe Burrow just being the greatest player maybe ever, like just go down the list. You have to have elite level play at that position now, and that's because you can you have to be able to attack the field vertically as well as horizontally. You can't just run a bunch of dump routes and, and win games. I don't think you can be just good and win a national championship anymore. I think defensive coordinators and talent have gotten too good. I think you have to be great. And and that's a question for Kyle Trask. There you go. That's, that's where I was going Mac, next. Yep. That's a question for Mac Jones. That's a yep. question for any Kellen Mond, anybody in the SEC. Are you good enough to be elite and be a playmaker, not just a game manager? Because I think we've evolved past that. I think you have to be elite now to win national championships. Not only coach, talent, roster, schedule, all that stuff, but now you also have to have the super quarterback to win. Well, before you jump in here, I think that's a, a, the question for, for you know for Kyle Trask and, and Jamie Newman are kind of the same. Can they be elite? Can they be the big time quarterback? The difference where you know the Florida side of this and where Florida fans get a little aggravated and when we see quarterback rankings and Jamie Newman ahead of Kyle Trask. Kyle Trask has actually done it in the SEC. He's actually performed against these type of defenses. Uh, you know, he did struggle versus Georgia, ad ad admittedly there, uh, but you know for the most part had a really good season versus some SEC defenses. Yeah, I mean, so going back to going back to Newman, I'm not sure that um, people who are criticizing him being ranked up there have watched a whole lot of film because the guy's got some real skills. And when you watch when you watch the ball come out of his hand, it comes out like a rocket, and he makes some beautiful throws. But when you watch the full game, so I went back and watched the Virginia Tech and NC State games in full, you do see why he's inconsistent. And so that's sort of the question, I think, for Georgia, and quite honestly, probably the question for Trask at Florida as well, is the level of consistency. The area where I think I get encouraged for Florida is when you look at Trask last year on second and 10 plus, he completed 67% of his balls, 8.4 yards per attempt. And on third and 10 plus, he completed 79% of his balls for 8.7 yards per attempt. So he got the ball out quick with a crappy offensive line, no running game, and there wasn't a drop off in his play. And he had to he, get the ball out quick because of that <laughs> offensive line. <laughs> but, 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 he, but one, I mean, he had 70 opportunities of either second and 10 plus or third and 10 plus, but he was able to do that and he was still pushing the ball down the field. So that's where I'd be encouraged when it comes to Trask. I think the place that I would be a little bit discouraged is some of his decision making in terms of holding on to the ball and some of the inconsistencies that we saw sort of come back up in that Virginia game in the Orange Bowl. He was bailed out in that game by Florida being able to run the ball much better than they had previously in the year. Now you hope, if you're a Florida fan, you hope that the injury, the knee injury they had against Auburn opens up the running game a little bit with him a little bit more. You also suspect that Emory Jones is going to take a step forward and help even more in the running game from the quarterback position. And then just, you know, one more year in the system. Like I said, last year against Georgia, that was the first time he'd, he'd really faced an elite defense. But if you're hanging your hat on Trask for 2020, the thing I'd hang my hat on is he gets the ball out quick and he was successful in third and long. And one of the reasons I'm not – scared at all of Kellen Mond at AM is because when you look at his third and long statistics, they're just terrible. And I think that's reflective of decision making. I think it's reflective of being able to read a defense pre-snap and do it well. And then even make adjustments when the defense makes, you know, when the defense shows you one look pre-snap and then changes post-snap. And Trash showed an ability to understand those things last year, but obviously he's still going to have to deliver. And, you know, we're not going to believe it until Florida beats one of the elite teams. Because even though Florida went 11-2 and last year, they lost the two games against teams that had more talent than them and against the teams that they have to win to win against to get to where they need to go. So, um, you know, Trash still has some stuff to prove. But, again, that third down is where I'd really look at and say that's where I think maybe he differentiates himself compared to some of the other quarterbacks who've been in Mullen's system thus far. I think you guys are, are touching on this. And just to quickly finalize our rankings at Athlon, Florida 6, Georgia 7, 
you're asking, you know, Jamie Newman's got a little bit more upside, maybe a little bit more talent than Kyle Trask. Kyle Trask has more experience, is more consistent than, than Jamie Newman. Who do I trust more? I trust Dan Mullen. That, that's mm-hmm. it. Like, I, I trust Dan Mullen to do that job better than I, I don't know about Todd Munkin. I think he's pretty good, but that that's the difference, right? Right there, if you want to boil it down to one issue, it's I trust Dan Mullen with a quarterback he's already played in the SEC, who's more consistent, may not have as much upside. And Jamie Newman may be great. He may be elite, but we don't know yet. We know what Dan Mullen's going to give us, and we know that Kyle Trask is pretty good, and we know Emory Jones is pretty good. I think that's sort of the – I mean, if you want to boil it down to one particular issue, that might be the reason we go with Florida over Georgia in that situation. Robbie and Spencer, I know you guys are pretty much the the, the level headed side of of, <laughs> of, the, of the of the fan base, and I'd like to thank you, Will and I are too, uh, on this side. And one thing Georgia the fan base loves to throw in Florida fans' face is you guys went through a wide receiver transition last year, and it really it really hurt the offense. And you know they like to bring it up for Florida too with Swain, Cleveland, Hammond, um, uh, Jefferson, all going on to the NFL, and it it, it it's not really. The, the same there, uh, you know, Jefferson, Hammond, Swain, Cleveland accounted for about 48% of the, the receiving yards last season, but Kyle Pitts was right up there with Van Jefferson. I know he's a tight end, but we're talking, you know, pure receptions, pure receiving yards here. Pitts was right up there with Van Jefferson as far as targets and yards go. Trevon Grimes had only five less receptions and then the departing Freddie Swains and Jacob Copeland would definitely see more targets. Kadarius Tony injured a good bit last year, has experience playing the position. So, you know, a lot of Georgia fans out there, you know, compare last year's Bulldog wide receiver situation and what was lost there to the Florida situation and, and how much it would hurt Kyle Trask, but it's not close to the same situation. Yes, Florida lost a lot, but they they, they re- return a lot too. They may take a step back there, uh, but, you know, you go back and look at what Georgia lost, not monumental loss there. Riley Ridley, McCole Harmon, Isaac Nottage, Jeremiah Holloman, and Terry Godwin – that was Georgia's top five receivers from 2018. They had to replace every bit of that. Florida does it, you know, Florida's got a little bit of luxury with what they lost. They still bring a lot back. So I, I don't think it's the, the, the same loss for Kyle Trask that it was for Jake Fromm last year. And, and a lot of people like to, to point that out. Oh, we'll see a drop. We'll see a drop for Kyle Trask because of the, the receivers that he lost. He also brings a lot back. Yeah, and I think too, I think for position wise, it's it's Florida still offensive line in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, the group that you're most concerned with. Is that group going to be upgraded? Did the additions, uh, are they enough? Because, yeah, like you mentioned, Tony was hurt a lot last year. So getting him back. And then, too, I think we've already touched on it with Pitts and Grimes and even uh, Jacob Copeland as well. But uh, Braden's touched on it. Rob even touched on it as well. The idea of scheme. If you can get these guys in the right scheme and they can run their routes the right way and all that stuff works out and they can get open, then, you know, you know, the, 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 you know, it's going to be the history books, if you will. So I think from a scheme standpoint, you're trusting in, in Dan Mullen to scheme these guys open. And then, yeah, they've got plenty of snaps under their belt. I think it's the offensive line that is, is going to be the biggest question mark for Florida going into the season. Can can I just bring up one point to be to poke the bear since we haven't really argued at all? Like we've all, like we've kind of we've all kind of been like nice and kind and like you know no problems whatsoever. We're like Stephen Lassen, the co-host with uh, with yeah. Braden, just like really nice. How Flor- about the Flor- Florida's going to win episodes over? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> how, about the, how about the fact that Bra- or Braden? How about the fact that Dan Mullen is one and nine against Kirby? Like. Are we? Are we? Are we just? Are we just gonna throw you're giving, that? You're, you're giving Kirby. You're giving Kirby credit for Saban wins. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I, uh, well, okay. Well, okay. Fine. <laughs> let, let's just say. What are they? Well, what what are we supposed to do then? Are we just supposed to take those on the table? No, I mean, I, I, but I, I'll, I'll agree with you to the point of Mullins zero three the last three years. I'll, I'll give you that. Well, I'll okay, that. That, that's fine. And, I, and vastly less talent in all three of those games. I mean, the Mississippi State game is pretty ugly. There's no denying that. But like, th- does Mullen then get credit for two natties with Tim Tebow? I mean, we got to give and then maybe maybe not you, there. but everyone else seems yeah. to. Everyone else seems to give every – Tim Tebow is all Dan Mullen. It had nothing to do with Urban Meyer. <laughs> well, Urban I, Meyer had nothing to do with Tim Tebow whatsoever. I, well, I think Urban Meyer is one of the greatest coaches of all times and one of the worst human beings, but whatever. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, know. I would agree with you. I, I think it's uh, – I, I think you stick to head coaching. I, I think you got to stick to the head coaches. I mean, Jeremy Pruitt's won a bunch of natties. That doesn't make him a better football coach than Kirby Smart or Dan Mullen. Um, I think you gotta, you got to you got to stick to the head coaching tenures if you're going to evaluate them. And – well, that's a very popular part for you go before before you go any further, Braden. In y'all's athlon rankings, you did have Dan Mullen ranked ahead of Kirby Smart. That 
Yeah, what the juice, Braden? What the crap, man? <laughs> I brought a whole bunch of headlines. So. How dare I? How dare I think Kirby Smart is the fourth best coach in America? How dare, How dare you? I think that? No, I, I listen. I think Jimbo Fisher, Kirby Smart, and Dan Mullen are basically the same. You flip a coin on any given day, you could argue one way or the other, and I think they're all great. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's no question about it, but they're all great. They they, you, they have proven to be great. Coach O, I think, is behind those guys. I think Gus Malzahn's behind those guys. I think those three I would hire all before. I don't think you can count the coordinator stuff. I don't think Kirby Smart being Nick Saban's assistant while having thousands more players than Mississippi State does. I don't think that matters. I, I think, you know, you could go to Dan Mullen and you could say, man, he beat the tar out of Coach O twice. Like, he beat LSU last year, two years ago at home in the Swamp. He, he smoked him as the Mississippi State coach. I mean, you can go round it. I don't think head to head is how you determine whether or not a coach is better than the other coach. I think both of these guys are excellent football coaches, and right now Kirby has this had has had the better team and has won both of those games in in the division. Dan Mullen's going to have to win that game eventually, just like Harbaugh is going to have to beat Ohio State eventually, even though Ohio State has better players every year. It, fans don't want to hear that. Eventually, you got to win that game and. Um, if that means overcoming some quote unquote recruiting deficiencies, and that's what he's going to have to do. Uh, but I, I think, uh, again, I, you told me I could start a team right now. I'd take Kirby Smart, Dan Mullen, and you can have the other one, and I'm fine. So <laughs> I, I do think it's a weird conundrum there. Like, if we're going out and playing backyard football, and Dan Mullen gets to pick 22 players, and Kirby Smart gets to pick 22 players, I'm not talking recruiting. They, you know, there's no filmed watch, they don't know who these players are. I think Dan Mullen, I, I think Dan Mullen to win that game. But when you look at college football and recruiting is such a huge part of it, you know, if, if I'm ranking coaches, uh, I'll probably do way head to head too much. I'll put smart ahead of Mullen until Mullen beats him, uh, head coach. Uh, it's just the way I, I have to view it right now. As you said, Braden, it's splitting hairs. You got one right behind the other. It, it's you pick one, you wake up a different morning, you can tell. But I, I probably do weigh the head to head uh, a bit more. And, you know, and, the, the blowout at Mississippi State a couple years ago, uh, a, few, a few years ago. And granted, yes, I'm, the, the scores have been close versus Georgia. Florida's closing the gap somewhat, but Georgia has controlled those games. And it never, you know, it, it's hard. It was hard to see Florida pulling as you're watching the game. Can Florida pull this out? Can Florida pull this out? It never really felt the point that, you know, Florida ha had a point in the game where I, I thought they were going to pull it out. So it, until I, I probably feel that as the fan when the fourth quarter starts and I'm oh Florida's going to win this game, I'll probably have Mullen Lawrence just Cager right behind wide open for 52 yard touchdown. L Lawrence Cager wide open, 52 yard touchdowns, 16 to 10. I just wanted to, just want to help, you know, just trying to poke the bear a little bit, David, because I was told that we were going to debate and we've just been really nice. And I appreciate that, <laughs> but I mean, come on. I, Brayden gets attacked all the time. He puts rankings up like he wants to get attacked. So I'm just, just waiting for some kind of fight to, to happen in some form or fashion. Spencer, you get emotional. Like, let's mention Tom Hanks and how much he sucks. Let's just talk about that. That'll get you mad. <laughs> well, so, there's no reason to bring up Tom right now. What okay? is Tom Hanks? <laughs> so, so if, if we want to, if we want to get things emotional, so yeah. when Florida beats Georgia this year, you're going to come on uh, yes. onto the podcast and sing our fight song, right? Hell no. I won't do that. I, I, won't. I don't think you want Robin Freeman. Clearly he has a lot of confidence in his team. If All right, here we go. Do that. Here we go. Uh, my alma mater is going to beat one of y'all's too. How about that? Are, <laughs> it will not be at Athens. A little bit. Hey, but before, before I was going, yeah, before I was going off, I was like, are we getting ahead of ourselves? Is it, I mean, most people are going to pick between Florida and Georgia. Uh, of course. If, we, if you look at it. Are we getting ahead of ourselves? Is, is is there a chance? What is the chance of if it's not Florida or Georgia that somebody else represents the SEC East? I I can't I can't see it. I it's I think we'll know by week three though, right? Like because Oklahoma plays Tennessee, Florida plays what the Citadel and Northeast Valley State as their you know non con games, and Georgia plays. Georgia we'll get, plays. We'll, we'll, we'll have Kentucky early on. So who, who, okay. we, who we struggled with? So. Georgia plays Bama and Virginia. Like so, by week three, we'll know out of those three teams who's legit, right? Like, is that too? Is that fair to assume? I, I, yeah, well, go ahead. Well, and this is one of the things I think that you know we've we've glossed over a little bit. We've talked about Newman quite a bit, but the fact that uh, the fact that Andrew Thomas and Isaiah Wilson both left tackles got drafted in the first round. I mean, when's the last time a team had? two new left tackles and a new quarterback and was able to, to really move the ball. I, I don't know. I can't necessarily remember and a new it, offense. 
and a new offense. But I mean, the tackles would worry me almost as much as the quarterback. I mean, you got to trust the you got to trust that your blind side is going to be clean. And you know, like you said, Virginia's not going to be a pushover, and Alabama certainly won't either. So um, I'm interested to see what what happens with with all the new personnel because it's not just hey, we're switching out Jake Fromm for Jamie Newman and we're bringing back some wide receivers from last year. It's you know, there's there's quite a bit of turnover there on the offensive line as well. I, I yeah, it was almost like oh, go ahead, Brendan. Well, I just I think the the comment about knowing early, I, I want to believe that's true. Um, I think Virginia is actually a really perfect test for Georgia. Mm-hmm. Very fundamentally sound defense. A lot of guys coming back. Not going to threaten you on offense at all. So Georgia should 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 shut them down. But it's a really good test for for the the new marriage of Munkin and 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 Newman. But you should win the game. So you lose to Alabama. You're two and one. How many college football stories have started two and one and ended up in national championships? Almost all of them. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of teams. I mean, Ohio State loses to Virginia Tech, wins the whole thing. Um, Auburn, you know, like you've seen Auburn make it to the national title game after losing early in the season. It, it just you and see, Georgia t- still had the chance last year, even after losing yeah, to South like, Carolina. If you I, get upset LSU, you're still you're still there. Yeah, I mean, I, you look at the SEC. It's going to be Georgia at LSU. It's going to be Florida, Georgia in the in the in the uh, the cocktail party. It, it's the, it's still a lot of huge games, middle to late of the season. I, I don't think we're going to know early. Uh, not to say that we won't know a lot about Newman and, and the offense, because I think that the Virginia test is a really really good test for them, but a game they should win. I just think you could easily start two and one and get beat pretty badly by Bama, who I think is going to just destroy people this year. And by the time you get to the Florida game, Georgia could be a totally different team. We mm-hmm. see it all the time in college football, and I, I think that's what makes the sport great is teams evolve over the course of the year, and you can be very different in week nine than you were in week three. And so if I'm a Georgia fan and, and you get beat by Bama, I, I'm just sitting there going, all right. Look at, I mean, look at Clemson. Clemson wins national championships after losing to Syracuse and Pittsburgh. So <laughs> uh, it, it, it can happen, and I, and I think, you know, I, I wouldn't – as long as you beat if – you, if you lose to Virginia and Alabama, yeah, then we know. Then they, we're in they, trouble, yeah. I, I, I think, like, what I want more than anything – is I, I I say I actually I want Georgia to beat Bama this year just for the sheer fact of that stupid statistic of Kirby of uh Saban being O or like 40, mm-hmm. 4700 and O against his assistants. Like I just I just want I just want Kirby to be the one that gets the one. Like don't, just don't miss the big picture. Win the natty, baby. It's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, and almost to Braden's point, yeah, it's almost as if lose that game to Alabama obviously you don't want to you're not going to do it on purpose but if you lose that game to Alabama that almost kind of sets the scales or resets the scales almost for you and you sort of get a chance to say okay we got the loss out of the way here's what we need to work on here's what we've uh, here's what's working here's what we've got to improve and then you know move forward from there so I know nobody is going to lose on purpose but um, you know it might work out in Georgia's benefit to uh, to have you know to experiment with some things early on and then figure it out almost in a uh, Dabo Sweeney like way. And, and we've seen it the last couple of years. I mean, Georgia has not been playing good going into the game in Jacksonville. They, they just haven't. And they figured that they got you know, both teams get that bye week before. Georgia's taking so much better advantage of that bye week going into that game, figuring things out. You know, running circles around Todd Grantham for whatever reason he. Could not get to Jake Fromm. Sacked him once in the last two games. It's it, it's a joke. You know, third and Grantham. I know lo- everybody loves the joke. It it, it was something. Especially last- Georgia fans. Especially, Especially Georgia fans. <laughs> yeah. o- overall, we've talked about this on the podcast. Overall, it has not been an issue, but it has been an issue in the big games. It has been an issue when it counts. It, it, and so it was an issue. It was an overall issue early on in his career as a defensive coordinator in college football. Overall, it's not been an issue except. For the game in Jacksonville last year versus LSU, in, in key moments of games, it, it has reared its head. So you know that's that that's the part. But Georgia hasn't, you know, Georgia has figured out things along the way to to get by Florida. As I said, you know, was really struggling last year, and, and then figured out a way to keep that offense on the field, uh, convert third down after third down. So and that that's the that's the big change for me. We, we keep talking about quarterbacks and keep talking about Dan Mullen. Todd Grantham's also got to be circled here, and, and, and for for Florida to to pull out Georgia, he has got to show up that Saturday. Now, this is where I think actually maybe the mental reps that Braden was talking about earlier can really make a difference on the defensive side of the ball. That you know if if. Uh, 
you know, the, the fact that Grantham, the blown coverage against Cager that you mentioned earlier, but that wasn't the only one. I mean, there's one against Jamar Chase against LSU and a few that were missed against Tennessee earlier. So, um, you know, I, I think the mental reps on the defensive side of the ball may really, may really help the defense for Florida more than, more than the offense where the offense already has the experience that you're sort of looking for. And those mental reps may be important on the other side. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. We probably, been uh, great. We could we could we could have went a whole lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have them back on again so they can sing that fight song. Hey, <laughs> again, I'm the one who I'm the one who picked Florida to win last year. Wait, are you allowed to sing the fight song though? Like, I no, know. I are no. You, what parts of the fight song are missing now? I don't I don't know. Like, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's, oh, trying yeah, to get, yeah. he's trying to get us in trouble, Dave. No, yeah, listen, yeah. I, I, listen, I'm waiting for the whole thing to dive into Rocky Top. It's gonna not. It's not gonna end up end well for anybody. <laughs> Brady, sure. you 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 feel good about the Vols? Are they, are, are are they back? Are they turning it around? No, but yeah. uh, they're getting better. So <laughs> okay, there, there's that. Uh, no, I think listen, they're, they're they're eight and four is about right. They'll be favored in eight games. They'll be an underdog in four, and if they can beat Florida at home or george on the road or oklahoma on the road which all seem very unlikely uh you know they'll be they'll be a good team i think tennessee kentucky both really good teams i think a and m's a good i mean there's there's a lot to like about the sec this year and you know quarterback play is going to be the biggest x factor in all of this because we don't really know exactly what's going to happen at that position around the league and just like with trask and newman if if either garantano or bailey if wilson's healthy if kellamon develops I mean, there's a lot of guys that could take another step and it could make for a really interesting – I mean, listen, the SEC is great no matter what, but it's going to be – I think we're in for a fascinating year. I, I just – we also could be in for 12-0 and 0, Bama just stomping everybody's souls again. So <laughs> just be prepared for that. Braden, if, if I told you that I knew that one of those three games, Oklahoma, Georgia, Florida, was a Tennessee win, which one would you bet the money on? Uh, Florida, it just because it's at home and because it's, er, it's a little bit earlier in the offensive line and – um, I think that game means a lot more to Tennessee players. Uh, so I, I, you know, there's, it's mostly just odds at that point. You're just playing the odds. I think Georgia later in the year is going to be better. So if you're playing them later in the year on the road, that's a tougher situation. I, I think they could beat Oklahoma, honestly, but I, I don't know how they score with them uh, unless Jeremy Pruitt comes up with some genius scheme that is going to stop a freshman quarterback, which is possible. And, and having Spencer Rattler as, as a, I think he's a redshirt true freshman. I don't know what they're called now. If you played games last year, but you didn't play, and you're a redshirt, <laughs> you know, with new rules. So I, I think it's Florida, and then uh, and then Oklahoma. Those two are the two they they got a chance at. But I I would still pick them at eight and four. Did we really accomplish anything here? We entertained <laughs> some people, Dave. We entertained some so. people. There was a good call. Yeah, well, I, think proved, uh, I think we proved Athlon's point that this is this is neck and neck that these yeah. two teams right there next to one another that where you look and ask questions about Dan Mullen, you know, Kirby might have it hunkered down in that area. And then when you ask questions about Kirby, uh, Dan's got it sort of taken care of on, on that end of things. So, and then where both of them might even have questions about coaching in, in, in big games and decisions that happen in big games, both of them might have to overcome those hurdles. So I think we, we've established that Athlon has their, 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 uh, their thumb on the pulse as always that you know this is neck and neck between these two teams it's gonna be a great game it's gonna yep. be an awesome game can't wait Brayden, you ever been nice. hopefully it happens have you ever been uh you know what i've been to texas oklahoma and i've been to a lot of college football games i have never been to i've never been to jacksonville and okay. out, out on the beaches and had a good time it's great well yep. fans are allowed you'll have to come yeah. man <laughs> I need good. I need good. I need good guidance. I need people to to guide yeah. me through the the murky waters of Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> just with come wear neutral colors. With, no, with one, no, no one will. No one will be mad at you if you just wear new, neutral colors. If I, if I show up with bright orange, is anybody going to hate me? <laughs> <laughs> I could have a. a I'd have a classic tailgate for you. It'll be. To... I could just wear my Mets gear. It'll look exactly like Florida Gators. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on how much moonshine you bring, man. That's true. If you, if you bring some Tennessee moonshine, people will let you in. I'm a Kentucky <laughs> bourbon fan myself. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Me too. All right. Well, one more time, gentlemen, before we go, uh, Braden, let everybody know where uh, where they can find you, man. Yeah, at Athlon, or at, at Athlon Sports is uh, the, the Twitter account for the company. AthlonSports.com for magazines. Click that little button on the top and buy your magazine. We appreciate it. We need support like everybody else. 
during these times. You can follow me at Twitter uh, on Twitter right there at Athlon Braden. Uh, and uh, rate, review, and subscribe to Cover 2 Podcast on uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a ton of fun. Yeah, Robbie, Spencer. Yeah, Rich Tradition College Football Podcast. You can find that on uh, on any uh, social media. or not social media, but uh, you can find it on any podcast uh, platform. And then I'm at uh, Spencer underscore Van Horn. And, um, Rob, you got kind of a complicated handle there. Which is that again? Spider-Man something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made it whenever we whenever freaking Twitter first started. At SpiderDude64. Yeah, I should freaking change that. So thank you for that. Um, uh, but yeah, our college football podcast is on, like you said, on every platform. Um, and I actually am doing a little sub series right now where, uh, it's called a perception check where I am taking college football programs the last 10 years and looking at the way people expected them to do and how they really should have done or how they, sh- their expectations should have been higher or lower. And the Georgia one was my first one. And it was a lot of fun to, um, maybe take some shots at Mort Rick. So that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've done our fair share of that plenty of times, too. All right, guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Will, whatever, what you got coming up on Read Reaction? Yeah, so earlier this week I wrote something about the Gator Bait cheer and uh, and some thoughts on that, obviously. A little bit controversial in, in Florida circles and got some football stuff coming up later this week, man. So excited to actually start getting back to talking about football and not pandemics and not talking about, uh, about you know, things that are uh, – political and we can get back to football and just start arguing about Kirby and Mullen again. We hope so. We hope so. All right. That'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at Gator Dave underscore S E C guys and girls out there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.